Welcome to Rogers Tech Talk. In this episode, we're talking with Blake Blackshear, the author of Frigate, the open source AI network video recorder. In the interview, we get to learn more about Blake. We talk about how Frigate got started. We learn more about version 13 and also what's next for Frigate in the future. The most highly anticipated feature of version 13 of Frigate are the custom models. They're gonna be made available through Frigate Plus, the model that's picking me up right now. These models are custom tailored to your specific screenshots from your security cameras. And now my interview of Blake Blackshear, the author of Frigate. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your background, open source community, and, and how the project got started? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I've, I've kind of always been a tinkerer. Um, kind of got into programming at a pretty young age, did a lot of robotics and stuff through high school. Um, ended up getting a degree in computer engineering, spent a few years in Dallas doing custom software development, consulting work for a regional firm. And, and then about 12 years ago, I moved to Nashville, uh, to start a healthcare technology company in the clinical genetic space. Um, and been here ever since. So, very cool. So how did Frigate start? What is it? something that you were having problems with, didn't like a lot of the alternatives or the security software. Um, just tell us a little bit more about uh, how the project started. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, at some point after my wife and I moved to Nashville, we decided to start family planning and looking for a place that was more permanent, right? So when you're renting, obviously, uh, the kind of scope of things you can do from a home automation perspective are pretty limited. So when we first were looking at, you know, buying our own place, um, I started really getting into home assistant, home automation stuff, and uh, really uh, was enjoying and kind of bought into the local only aspect of, of you know, running your home automation uh, locally. So um, cameras were just a component of that. Started looking at what the options were out there. I mean, this was back in, you know, 20... 2015, 2016, right? So oh, wow. yeah. home automation, we were talking about like the first generation Wink hubs that were, they had commercials for, um, the, the V1 smart things hubs, right? Really limited, yeah. uh, heavily cloud dependent uh, solutions that were out there uh, that just didn't really scale well. And so, um, so I was looking at home assistant for all of that sort of stuff. And, um, <clears throat> my parents actually ended up building a house at about the same time. And so I was looking at camera solutions for them and, and for myself. And, um, yeah, I mean, I just didn't really, I wasn't really excited about any of the options that were out there. Um, a lot of them were heavily cloud dependent. A lot of the, it was really, uh, I think really first generation nest cameras were, um, uh, coming out and, little bit of um i think it may have even been back when it was like more drop cam um before all the google stuff right so i just wanted something minimal i really wanted something that i could um pull into home assistant so i actually started by uh just running the motion project the open source motion project um to create little clips of video whenever there was motion and i created a little simple web ui to be able to view those motion events um and that worked okay i also ran ffmpeg in the background just as like a service on the server and it was just doing something kind of similar to what frigate does today where it was just recording segments of video kind of one file at a time and i made a simple little cron job to expire uh, files over a certain age. So I kind of had a backup 24 seven recording and then I used motion and this was before really like motion. I, the UI was, was really built. And, um, so I built a little, a little UI to scroll through all those events. And it was, ju it was just like an overwhelming amount of like events, um, that had motion in it. Right. Like, uh, it, it was just, not really feasible to scroll through and, and look at that stuff. Um, and I didn't really want to have to do that. And this was really uh, about the time whenever everybody was starting to experiment and play with TensorFlow. And I was just, you know, naturally curious about well, what is this TensorFlow thing and what are people using it for? Um, and I kind of just 
did like a weekend project seeing like, and I wonder if it's possible to like with a pretty powerful machine to run object detection frequently enough on a live video feed thinking like, oh, you know, like unless I go invest in a bunch of really high end hardware, I'm going to have to look at, you know, like maybe a frame a second or something like that. Um, and so I spent the weekends just kind of toying with um, FFmpeg and OpenCV. Um, actually, bef the first version was just all OpenCV, like reading directly in our TSP feed. I would grab a still frame um, and I would send that through uh, TensorFlow, just like the full TensorFlow version, right? Um, and it was massively CPU intensive. Um, and it was just coincidentally, at about the same time, I'm sure it was um, a Google recommendation for me in some context, like the Coral was developed and it popped up. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. Let me, I just ordered one on a whim to see if I can make it work. And I, I adjusted the pipeline to use the TensorFlow Lite libraries with the Coral. And it was just kind of like, wow, now I could, now I could actually do real time video analysis uh, without having to, you know, I was originally thinking that I was going to have to like basically build a beefy server with a GPU in it to do object detection in real time on camera feeds. And I was, that was, that was my original thought. Um, but the coral really expanded the scope of what would be possible there. So yeah, it was just kind of like a weekend project that I like on a whim created. And, um, then I used it internally, um, internally, I use it myself and at my parents' house for, um, for a while, um, before deciding, eh, maybe some other people would think this was interesting and decided. Yeah, to make for it sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's definitely must be hard to take something like that, right? You develop it yourself and sort of operationalize it, clean it up. I mean, it's the progress. I mean, I've been using forget for gosh, two over, I feel like over two years now. I mean, it's, it's grown so much, but it definitely, definitely must have, I mean, it's, taking a lot of work to get where it is now for, for sure. From where, yeah. <laughs> especially where, where you started it from, it's, it's so polished now for, from, uh, I'm sure where, where, uh, where you originally started it from. The, the yeah. original version was, um, was so much more basic, right? I mean, I had, I was, remember I was coming from a place where I had FFmpeg doing 24 seven recording in the background. Um, and so I thought of Frigate as like just exclusively a real time analysis. Like it, it, all it did was real time analysis on video and it, um, just like sent event. It just sent information via MQTT. Like it, the early versions didn't even like record anything. They just sent like snapshots images. And then you would use those, I would use those images to go back and look at the 24 seven stuff I had in the background running with a, you know, a different service with FFmpeg. And it was really basic. You had, um, you would define your predefined regions of an image. Like I want to run detection in like these three parts of the image. And what it did is it ran detection on those three parts of the image, every single frame. That's all it did. It just read the video feed, ran object detection on it, and it had no concept of, um, like, tracking a person over time. It had no, it was just, a, like, it was pretty, like, a raw kind of video analytics feed over MQTT, and uh, I was able to pull that in with some pretty basic Home Assistant uh, entities to be able to pull in like the last person detection and create some basic sensors about whether or not a person was currently being detected. But there's no concept of um, like a an event with a start and an end. It was just you know simply on off type stuff. Yeah, I, I mean personally, I think that's one of the keys to forget success is the whole motion detection optimization. You know, only doing valid you know image. Um, uh, detection right when we see an image and you know we'll talk a little bit later how that's even improved in in the newer version and especially from a performance perspective too right i mean that's why i i, I run it on sort of bc server but i know some people are running it on raspberry pis or you know really low end pcs and, and that's that's the beauty of it especially if you have uh you know low fps camera low resolution stuff i mean 
it can go really, really far away. Um, or you could do it more on the, the higher end side, how I'm, I'm doing some stuff. <laughs> but um, before this, had you had any experience with OpenCV, FFmpeg? It doesn't sound like it. That was sort of your first foray into not, to all this. Not really. I mean, all my professional software development, it really started in C Sharp. Um, I mean, in college, I did a lot of Java, which is pretty Java and C++. Then I did C Sharp professionally right out of school. And then um, when I moved to Nashville, really largely pivoted over to working in JavaScript, Node.js type stuff. Um, so I hadn't really used Python other than just for, you know, server scripting, that sort of stuff, which is a pretty common use case for it. So I was kind of generally familiar with Python as a language and it's easy enough to pick up. I think just so many of the libraries around AI, ML are built around Python and that community is really huge. So that's really, um, but Python, this is, this project is really my only like substantial Python experience. Um, and I had done a lot with FFmpeg. Like I was pretty familiar with some of the, um, you know, video containers and video codecs and that sort of stuff. Like I kind of knew my way around FFmpeg pretty well as a, as kind of a binary for a bunch of different reasons over the years. Um, but you know, not nothing, no OpenCV experience, no prior TensorFlow. I mean, TensorFlow was pretty young at that point, but, um, no, I hadn't had any prior experience with it. I just was curious. And part of it was, you know, from a, in my professional career, I had kind of moved into more managerial roles. I wasn't as active hands on keyboard as much. And so right. this became my side project to kind of scratch that itch. Like I couldn't let go of that entirely. So. No, I, I totally hear you. that's one of the reasons I, I run this channel is just to talk to people like you tinker with stuff because some sometimes work and you know, it's, uh, it's fun pays the bills, right? But uh, maybe it doesn't satisfy you in certain ways. Um, so going back to community, like you mentioned, you know, I mean, using all the different Python libraries, but the thing that I've been really most impressed with you and just the whole forget community itself is just the, the amount of community engagement. I mean, I know back before the um, um, the GitHub discussions was more of a thing and you were answering on the home assistant forums. I remember you answering a question for me about building one of the forget versions uh, with um, NVIDIA support for decoding the FFmpeg streams. And even to this day, you're still answering tons of questions. You have other contributors that are beyond helpful to people. So just get your thoughts on that, because that's not common for every open source author. I mean, some authors sort of you know leave their projects in disrepair, don't talk to the community. I don't know if there's anybody that's inspired you, other projects, or how do you go about you know getting the motivation to help people versus just sort of being that person behind the wall developing all the stuff? I think it's just my uh, I wouldn't say that I was like inspired by other projects per se. Um, I think part of it's just like my nature and the way, I mean, I'm kind of um, that way in, in other regards too. Um, but I think for me, it's just the best way for me to stay in tune with what challenges users are, users are having. Um, what kind of features and really understand, right? Like in my current role at work, I'm, I'm in a product role, right? So I spend a lot of time thinking about really understanding and empathizing with the users. That's why the, the feature requests are really the way that they are for Frigate, which is like, explain to me what you're trying to accomplish. Like, don't tell me you want a button here. Tell me like right. what you need and why you need it so that I can really understand um, and so for me, just kind of being in tune with all that stuff is just a way for me to keep my finger on the pulse of what, what users are asking for and what they're using Frigate for, especially in the early days, like I didn't really know much about that. And so I use that at, to just kind of, um, help me prioritize what, you know, what's important to work on, what's going to have the biggest impact, those types of things. Um, yeah, no, that, I mean, it totally I'm, makes I'm sense. Super... It's it's yeah, it's just one of those things where you know you, I'm sure a lot of other people notice this too. You go to some projects and they're maybe they're actively being maintained, but there's no there's no community, there's no feedback. The you can't reach the authors. I mean, 
that's a that's a main reason a lot of people want to standardize. It's like I chose to standardize on it versus some other projects because of the community. It makes a, a huge, huge difference. Um, I mean, so, it is exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I uh, I wake up. I mean, people all over the world use it, right? So, like, right. I wake up every morning to dozens of inquiries and issues yep. and discussions um, across uh, the Home Assistant Discord. Uh, cameras channel, which is pretty a lot of active conversation about frigate. Yep. To there's a whole frigate NVR subreddit, which is just grew organically. I didn't have anything to do with that. Then you have GitHub issues. I mean, it's it's just nonstop. And there's been periods of time where I've just been like, I can't. Um, and it's 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 a struggle sometimes to balance, uh, you know, helping people and working through those issues. Uh, because it truly can become a hindrance to actually improving Forget itself. Um, right. You know, given I I only have so many hours a week that I can really spend on Forget, which is just a side project for me between full time job and family. Right? Like, yeah, I have to be careful. It's easy for me to sit down in the mornings when I get a little bit of time before work to do some work on Forget. To you know three, four, five issues in, like, boop, all that time's gone. I didn't make any progress right. on anything I wanted to, right? Um, so there's been t periods of time where I've had to just be like, I've really got to pull back. I've had some various approaches to that where, um, you know, for a period of time, it was just a rule of thumb that I didn't respond to any issues for 24 hours uh, because I was finding that a large portion of users – would end up solving their own problem or finding the answers to their own questions within the first 24 hours. And it was just too much um, to, to try to relentlessly go after. Now Now that um, sure every everyone who's interested in Frigate is pretty well familiar with, with Nick uh, Moen, who's like um, just like a relentless uh, contributor to Frigate. Um, and he's really been able to help uh, create the space um, for me to do a lot of the things that I'm working on now um, and not just be fully overwhelmed with trying to, to provide support. So, Yeah, no, it, it totally makes a difference when you have uh, other contributors in there. So going back to the community, has there been any really sort of obscure, interesting use cases you've seen with Frigate that maybe you didn't think of? And we have like the, you know, commodity ones, right? Using some of the, um, you, know, um, you know, trigger automations, right? Um, is any really weird stuff or weird objects that people ask for <laughs> that, are, that are not built into the model that maybe people try to, uh, to train that you know about? I'm sort of curious. I think um, there's been a few interesting things that like I just hadn't thought of before. So uh, I think there was a user in New Zealand who was having problems with big uh, sheep coming too close to his property and damaging like some of the um, you know, landscaping and, um, other stuff on the property. So he was like detecting sheep and then used an automation to like, uh, flip the blinds up and down, which was just enough to startle them and get them to back away from the property a little bit. Um, I've heard of people using it, uh, actually using the bear detection from the default Coco model to provide alerts to like their local wildlife services. If there's bears detected in certain areas, um, there's a whole sub project called, um, like who is at my feeder that ties in with frigate where you like some people have a camera by their bird feeder. And so, um, when there's a bird detected, it like integrates through MQTT and it, um, runs a classification model to identify the type of bird. And then there was a whole Twitter account created that was like, it was just a, it was just an instance of frigate that detected birds at the feeder and then ran a classification model and then posted an image and said, Hey, welcome to my feeder Cardinal or Robin or like various bird names or whatever. Um, so there's been a that's bunch really of cool. kind of random little things like that. Yeah, that, that's cool. I mean, it's, it's never endless possibilities. I, I use for, I mean, the automation, um, I used it in one of mine to, you know, flip an IR blaster to turn on a, a tablet on my wall, just like simple things like that. But it's like, it's so, it just works so elegantly. I mean, there's, you know, there's big things with the millimeter wave, like presence sensors and stuff like that. But like, it's sort of, 
I don't know. For me, doing it with video, actually really validating somebody's there and not putting other, you know, frequencies in my house, it made, uh, <laughs> made a little bit more sense. Um, so going back to um, Forget deployments, installations, what does your uh, Forget install look like? Are you running it on a dedicated server, Raspberry Pi, um, Home Assistant add-on? Um, just tell us a little bit about your setup. Yeah, I, uh, it's evolved a lot over the years, um, uh, but it's been mostly just variations of like small form factor PCs, um, and it runs just as another service. I run all my home automation stuff and all my services through uh, just standard Docker Compose, so I just use Home Assistant Core. I've always found, I mean, at least... For sure, in the early days, Home Assistant OS um, was just too volatile of an environment for me to manage um, the kind of frigate uh, container within because there were so many things changing in the underlying OS and trying to make sure that the coral drivers were supported and like some of the underlying things that frigate really, because it does have a pretty tight um, connection to the, to the hardware, right? So... Um, I run everything just on a, um, right now I'm running it on, um, a, uh, a little, uh, mini server from seed studio called a reserver, uh, which is just a little Intel PC, but it has like slots for full hard drives in it. So it's an all in one device and I just run, and this has been the case for, um, for a while now. I just, I just run install plain Debian server and I just install Docker, and I have a compose file that spins up all my servers. I run a bunch of other stuff too. I run the Zigbee to MQTT, and I run Z-Wave JS, and you know, basically all the same things. Probably like half a dozen uh, services on the same server, um, and I have it all networked together. Um, and then I put all those services behind a reverse proxy, and. Uh, serve them up on their own subdomain. So like Frigate has a dedicated subdomain and then I have all those services sitting behind a general um, authentication layer. So I have a single point of auth for all those services. Yeah, I mean, the server has um, an Intel um, uh, CPU. So I just use the standard like Bappy hardware acceleration stuff to decode the video. Um, and I use a, I just use a USB coral. I've got a, I have a, a decent sized collection of corals, as you might imagine, um, over the years, just trying different ones. They used to be super easy to get, right? So I was like, well, these things are only like 20 bucks. I'm just going to order four of them. Um, so, um, but yeah, I do. I've set up uh, my favorite setup is, and the, another reason I really like the reserver too is because it has a dual NIC. So, I think the ideal setup for a frigate uh, instance is a you know whatever size um, kind of small form factor PC you need. There's a bunch of them. I really like the mini forum ones and one that has dual NICs, and it's just easy to configure all your cameras with static IPs and a standard PoE switch, plug those into a dedicated port, and use the other port for all the outbound connections. So it makes it really easy to isolate all your cameras on a dedicated network that doesn't have internet access, um, and then those also aren't stealing any bandwidth from anything else on your local network either. So I think that's that's been a pretty robust setup for me. I've, I've set up Frigate for a few kind of friends and family as well, um, and th that setup's been, you know, a stable setup that I don't even have to check on it for, you know, a year. Um, I'm like, oh, they're like two versions behind, but, you know, it's stable and I don't really want to mess with their setup. So, um, yeah. but yeah, those, no. those tend to work well. Yeah, no, I totally hear. Uh, I set it up for uh, my brother at his house. I got 12 cameras on it and um, I haven't, he's still on you know, one of the 12 builds. Um, I haven't touched it in a while, but uh here at my house, I'm running version 13, the beta two version right now. Um, running two two deployments of it. We'll, we'll talk a little, little bit about that later. But um, I didn't actually upgrade Forget for a while. 
I just sort of left it alone. It was working good, no false positives. And then, but then when the new version comes out, like we'll talk about in a little bit, it was, there was just too many cool new things in there for me to just be on the old version. But it, it, there is that mindset of like, you know, this is sort of an important part of your <laughs> home automation security thing. You probably don't want to touch it too often. So it really depends on, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, if you're married or have a partner, you know, how often you want to get yelled at if things don't go right. You know, you upgrade the new version, not that there's anything wrong with it, but as a lot of people know, there's a lot of config updates, little minor little things you have to change and stuff like that. So it's not a, uh, <laughs> sometimes not a super trivial thing to upgrade to the new version, especially if it's in, uh, it's in beta. Um, in your deployment at home or any of your family, is any weird false positives that have, you know, come along. I mean, we all get them, especially in the past, right? And if you don't tweak stuff, but there's any like constant ones, any like really weird ones or anything like that, or? Not really. I mean, I, yeah. well, my parents um, had some funny ones when they, the first year they put out their Christmas decorations uh, and they had this like, you know, cut out Santa that was like way off <laughs> in the distance and it like, was a really high scoring. Um, so it's funny, those kinds of things where um, you kind of left, you kind of end up scratching your head being like, is that really a false positive? Or is that <laughs> like, just, you know, is it really yeah. a false positive if you have a skeleton <laughs> sitting in a chair on your porch right. for Halloween decoration, and it detects a person? I'm not so sure. So <laughs> No, I totally get it. I yeah, I've been wanting to like buy like a cardboard cutout, and I'm, I'm assuming it's gonna probably detect it as a human, depending on you know the the size of it and stuff like that. But it's, I guess that's better than having like other stuff. You know, I mean, it uh, just you know a potted plant. You know, over the years, people have weird stuff they post in the discussion stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, my... it looks like a human. It's not that bad, I guess. I mean, it's. Uh... <laughs> How yeah, often I got, is that a, gonna happen? I got a grill this last summer and that was triggering some false positives. Um, yeah. And then I was able to train those out. And then um, I also, um, my robot lawnmower was kind of relentlessly detected as a car. Um, fortunately, it, it's it's much smaller than a real car would be. So it was pretty easy to filter out. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. So. Like I mentioned, I'm running uh, version 13 beta 2 here at home. I've been running it for, gosh, I don't know, whenever, whenever it came out, a couple, like two, three weeks ago. And um, thankfully, thanks to you, we got into the uh, the beta for Frigate Plus. So I've been doing that for about two, three weeks now. So let's just first start off. I mean, 13 is going to be a huge release. There's, besides the custom model stuff, there's new object uh, motion detection, um, we have audio detection with another library built in. So can you just talk a little bit about, um, we'll, we'll go, we'll push the, the custom model stuff to, to um, next, but talk about a little bit the, the new motion detection, how that's going to improve Frigate from a performance point of view, and also, uh, you know, help to reduce false positives and, and the, uh, the new audio detection support. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of new features in the next version, which has kind of historically been, been true for the last couple of releases. Right. Um, and part of that is just because um, it, it helps reduce support volumes to have a fewer number of releases because there's just less churn and change all the time for people. Um, so um, it's a it's a it's a pretty big feature set. Um, yeah, the the motion detection, the, the challenge is I was finding in in 12 is that uh, I wasn't. I just really wasn't able to get good, consistent motion detection at night. Even with kind of tuned cameras, um, I like as I would walk out my front door and start walking down the steps. You know, according to motion, I would just disappear. Even though I could, I could pretty clearly see it with my eyes. And so, while a lot of people, you know, weren't getting false positives, like, well, of course you're not getting false positives if things aren't getting detected as motion and object detection isn't being run. So, I, I think that was a uh, that was kind of the impetus to to make some updates there, um, and I just I hadn't looked at the or reconsidered the way motion detection worked in, in you know quite a few versions, and so I I spent a lot of time testing all the built-in motion detection libraries that are in the OpenCV framework, um, 
those didn't really work out very well. Surprisingly, I had high hopes that those were going to be um, like really performant, you know, written in C and going to work really well. But I think they're really more designed around running high accuracy motion detection on high resolution. Um, whereas Frigate just like doesn't really have to be that perfectly accurate in terms of where the motion is because it's following up with object detection. So, I mean, the whole point of motion detection in Frigate is to like just try to be as lightweight as possible and be accurate enough to trigger object detection to run when it has to. Um, and I ended up being able to kind of rework um, the motion detection. It uses, you know, a lot of the OpenCV stuff. It's just basically looking at the differences in pixels, right? Like you would expect for motion detection. Um, and it runs that through a couple of different filters. Um, but I ended up with something that um, pretty consistently used less CPU than what there was before. Um, the, the flip side of that was it, it, it's just a little bit more sensitive than what existed before. So I think especially in the initial releases, uh, like the first beta, um, quite a few people said, man, I'm getting so much higher CPU load and so I'm getting a lot more false positives. Well, it's because it's the motion detection is a lot more sensitive. It's picking up a lot more things as motion and your object detection is running a lot more frequently. And if, if you're running object detection five times as much as you were before, you're going to have a lot more CPU load and you're going to have, um, you're going to have more false positives, just shots on goal, right? I mean, this, if you're, if you're running, so there's kind of a balance there. We kind of tuned a few things, made some adjustments, and I think it's working better now. Yeah. So with the audio detection, we're you're using a library called YamNet. So I was just sort of curious about how that came to be, if that was something that was asked by the community. And also, too, I think with YamNet and then previously with um, uh, GoToRTC, we're building in a lot of these third party solutions into Frigate. So just so your thoughts on that versus sort of, you know, just pointing users to use them and how, how you think that's going to make things easier as people uh, set, set this up? Yeah, I mean, Yamnet was a, um, I mean, audio detection was like submitted as a proof of concept. Um, I think actually, like in the last version as a, you know, POC pull okay. request. Um, and we, uh, it, but it's really just another TensorFlow light model. Um, so it, it's not too different. It's just the Mnet's the like I guess the model architecture for audio detection, um, and we're already bringing in the audio, already decoding it. We basically already had pr with pretty you know little effort access to the the audio stream. The problem was at the time that we didn't have a good way to incorporate audio events, um, and before we implemented the audio, we added the feature for custom events. So we added the API endpoints to be able to. Um, trigger an event manually if like uh, your doorbell buttons pressed or a motion sensor goes off like a you know traditional IR motion sensor goes off um, and uh, when we once we implemented that we realized that it would be really really easy to just internally use the exact same API endpoints to run an audio detection process um, alongside the primary processes so um, that's how it works. It, it interfaces with Frigate using the same API endpoints that are made externally available for external events. Um, and it's a pretty lightweight uh, in terms of CPU process to do that analysis. So, Awesome. Yeah, I haven't got a chance to check it out yet, but I'm definitely uh, excited. Another thing to play around with. So it would be, uh, be interesting to see what people come up with in use cases. I'm thinking maybe smoke alarms or dogs barking babies crying i'm assuming it has, <laughs> has yeah i think it's, so it's been interesting, interesting to, to like see glass speech breaking event. yeah What's that? just speech yeah. like speech events are really interesting um a lot of times you it'll pick up speech and there's not any there's nothing on the camera visibly but you can you know i can just i can hear people talking on the phone as they're walking past my house walking down the sidewalk um, it'll pick that up as a speech event and it'll, it'll start the event, you know, before they're even in view. Uh, it's cool. been interesting to hear some of the speech events that, you know, pop up at like <laughs> three in the morning. Um, you'd be like, what the heck? Who was walking around at three in the morning talking and what were they saying? Um, so yeah, I don't know. It has some, it has some interesting use cases. It has a huge library of sound types that it can detect. Uh, I haven't really played with anything other than outside this, the defaults. Um, right. but you do have to tune your 
kind of baseline volume level a little bit so it's not running all the time just on like background noise and everybody's cameras are a little different so you can yeah. have to play with that a little bit makes sense so going back to new stuff in, in uh, version 13 you know frigate plus launched uh, along with uh, version 13 at least the custom model support for it um i've been running it for about two three weeks now i'm on uh I think number six of my my credits uh, training stuff, and overall, been really blown away by the by um, you know the, the accuracy of it and the, the whole process. So, just sort of curious. I know you posted some on the discussion boards, right? You know um, how long it's taken. I'm just sort of curious. So originally, the models that we've all been using for the past school years are based on the the Coco data set. There's 330,000 images on there. Are you still using any of those of that data set for the frigate custom model and then topping on some user submissions or just talk a little bit about you know what it's taken to, to get this custom model uh, finally out yeah i thought that that would be a good approach initially um, and like you said there's like three hundred thousand images in there and so i had thought that that might be a really good seed data set to go through and I spent a lot of time trying to review and pluck out the examples from the Coco data set that I felt were at least somewhat representative of what person objects looked like on security cameras. Um, but then there was a bunch of things that I wanted to include in the label set for Frigate Plus that weren't in Coco, right? Like I wanted, I wanted to label license plates on cars. I wanted to label faces on people. Um, so it wasn't quite like it didn't quite give me everything I needed. And there was a lot of annotation that was still needed, even on the subset that I plucked out of there. And I think I ultimately just decided to like, uh, it hurt a little bit, but just to like give up on using the Cocoa data set altogether. Um, Cause it just never really panned out the way uh, that I wanted to. And I knew that ultimately it was always going to be a stop gap. Um, and so I just decided if, if I can get, um, an initial model on purely Frigate Plus submitted images, uh, even if it's, even if maybe it could be a little bit better if I sourced a bunch of external data, um, that since that was ultimately going to go away, that I just felt like it would be better to keep going with Frigate right. Plus data. Yeah. So, so, so no, how long I'm did that take you? Data. I feel like it's been a year or almost a year that oh, since you more, since yeah. forget plus since you've had people submitting images and honestly like i'm i'm sort of embarrassed now that i when it first uh launched in the product i i wasn't submitting images you know and then a couple weeks ago uh you know i saw the custom models were available and i just started uploading like crazy and um it's it's i don't know i think it's just human nature right it's like you're like, uh, is it coming out? I think it, it just took so long. A lot of people were thinking like, you know, and then was it ever going to come out? So, I mean, it, is, has it been a year, almost a year? Oh, it's, been, it's been more than that. Um, more than a year. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I think a, a big part of it was just like I mentioned earlier, right? I have a limited amount of time to work on this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Frigate Plus is a different thing than Frigate itself. And so bet between like full-time job, family, all the normal Frigate stuff, and then Frigate Plus stuff too, right? So like there's even less time left over for some of that sort of stuff. And that, that was a part of it. Um, but um, some of it was just like a really steep learning curve. Um, it was just an idea that I posted in the discussions in the spring of 2021. Like, hey, if I could figure out how to do this, would people be interested in it? Like, would it be a service people would be interested in paying something for? Um, because it was it was something that I didn't really think, I couldn't really figure out how it could possibly make sense in a pure open source community concept, right? I mean, you're never really going to be able to pull together a bunch of people's private images into an open data set that anyone can see. Like you're just not going to get enough people to contribute to that, that base to, I, at least I didn't think so. Um, so I thought, Hey, this is a great thing um, that I could build on the side as a like kind of companion service to Frigate. I think of it a lot like the way that um, the Nabucasa team provides kind of complementary services to the open source home assistant project and really 
you know, want to try to keep Frigate Plus in the camp of like services that it just doesn't make sense or it's not possible to provide in an open source capacity or things that are just kind of conveniences that you're totally fine to set it up yourself. But if you want to, you know, pay a small fee, um, it can be a lot easier. Um, so it's similar in nature to kind of the, the Home Assistant Cloud model there. Um, but yeah, so I proposed the idea in spring of 2021 um, and, you know, kind of decided, hey, let me see if I can uh, make this happen. So I mean, the first thing I had to do was like, it, can I even figure out how to do this? Um, so I spent a lot of time really just trying to um, go through the motions of reproducing some of the demo models that are trained on the Cocoa data set. So downloaded the Cocoa data set and spent like a long time really um, fig trying to figure, you, you would think that it would be easy to reproduce, um, but it's really not. Um, the, you get little bits and pieces of how it's done um, in the TensorFlow um, uh, open source code and some of the kind of pipeline configurations. But a lot of those are really only work on these like mega GPU instances that Google has in their data center. Um, it's really hard to reproduce some of that stuff. Um, and a lot of the collab tutorials for training models don't work anymore. Um, so there's a lot of kind of hiccups there. Um, and, and then the other part is that it's a massive data set. And if you're training it, if you're training a model from scratch, the feedback loop is a long, long, long time. So, I mean, I had initially started doing some of the work using the Google's collab instances. I kind of was paying for a GPU through kind of the collab instances and I mean, we're talking about like easily two weeks to figure out like, hey, did, did the thing that I'm trying, did it, does it work? Um, so it's a lot different than, you know, writing code where you like, you can write code, you can try it and you know, you know, instantly if it's working. A lot of times with these models, like they don't like spiral out of control until, you know, it's been eight days and now like, oh, that, that didn't work. Um, and there's a million knobs to turn in terms of how these models are trained and stuff. So it took me a long time to be able to just get to a place like it was probably the, I think it was the fall um, before I was able to get to a point where I was like, okay, I think I can actually do this. I can actually train a model. If I had my own data set, I can do it with a Coco. I could swap it out with a, with a pure um, Frigate Plus data set. Um, so it, 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 to me, it kind of hit a threshold where I, I had enough confidence I could do it. Um, and so in the fall is when I really um, kind of went heads down and decided I'm gonna create a business around this. I'm gonna create an LLC. I mean, you can't just like have people all over the world uploading kind of private images um, without having like a real business structure in place, right? A real privacy policy. I had to like get attorneys to review all that sort of stuff. I had to, you know, get all that done. Um, and I built the whole initial version of the Frigate Plus UI, right? Which is like, I gotta start somewhere. It's a chicken and egg problem, right? Like I need some baseline set of images, um, but I can't really offer anything in return for it yet. Um, so, so I built the ability to upload images and annotate them and save them and and um, in Frigate Plus. <laughs> and then the next, the following version of Frigate that came out I integrated the submit to Frigate Plus button there. Um, but not surprisingly, like there really wasn't like all that many uploads. Um, it probably took about, it probably took about six months to get a significant enough data set in Frigate Plus submissions to like, okay, now's the time to like start on like figuring out the methodology. I wanted to do some things differently in terms of how the models were trained. Um, in particular, um, the way that um, sections of your images are shown to the model during training is trying to emulate the way that Frigate does it in real time. So, it's trying to teach the model to recognize objects using as close of a context as I can get to like what it's gonna see when it's running in real time, um, which is like my hypothesis was that, that that would, you know, 
pr provide better results, right? Um, so, you know, spent a lot of time working on that sort of stuff. Um, so now we're in the, where are we in the, we're in the fall of, uh, like late 2022, right? Um, and a big part of the challenges was, is especially images submitted in that first six months were mostly, you know, people who signed up for an account, hit the upload button, but never really made an effort to go in and annotate anything. So a huge portion of this, the images that I had early on didn't even have annotations or maybe had like halfway annotated images. And so like I had to, I had to pull in a lot. Like I wanted a diverse sampling as I could, but that also meant that like I was pulling in a lot of images that just like I had to manually annotate. Right. Um, that, that was my next question is like, what percentage of like the baseline model is you annotating is it like, 30%, 40%? More. Or... Yeah, More. it's probably like 80%. Um, oh, God. Because, because the, the, what, what ended up happening is you had like a, a pretty small concentration of users who were excited enough about it and motivated enough to actually annotate properly. Right. Um, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just um, that they weren't annotated it was that a lot of times like people's annotations weren't good you know like uh boxing in a person but it's like way bigger than the person actually is or like just like inaccurate annotations right so i, I went through and kind of adjusted and corrected and fixed things and it's just mind-numbing right i mean I did it for thousands and thousands and thousands of images, hours and hours and hours of time going through and kind of correcting those um, to kind of get enough of a baseline to be able to start the feedback loop. Um, yeah, so that, that, that took a long time. And then once I was able to use those to train a model, then I had to figure out, well, how am I gonna like, tune these models to work a little bit better on for individual users than the base model right um so then i had to build that whole methodology tried a bunch of different things um i mean you can get on google and search about fine-tuning object detection models and like uh it sounds really easy from some of the medium articles you'll find but it is not uh it is not easy to get good results there um but you can kind of see if you look, if you're familiar with some of the like training metrics, right? Like what you end up seeing is like this, um, like the the learning or the, the, the performance metrics for a model, like they're pretty steep in the beginning and then it tapers off. And so what you end up seeing is the base model, you can see, you know, it trains for two weeks, right? And it goes through this really slow, gradual increase. And then what happens is whenever I add the fine tuning layer at the end, you get this little jump at the end. It's just a, it's just like a little jump and improvement for accuracy relative to your specific images on top of that baseline. Um, and I think that's just something that a lot of people don't, don't quite understand, like how the process works. Um, and how many, how many hours, I mean, it would be if, if, if the, if, the models were trained from scratch on individual users images they would just need thousands upon thousands of images and it would take it would take two weeks and you know you know 200 bucks of training time every every round right so um i didn't really know how all that was going to play out but that's that's where it yeah it's just it's not a practical scenario i can't tell you how many times i've seen on the frigate discussions people trying to come up with their own models and or say they want to do it they have some experience but like you said it's i think it's a mixture like you said of just having such large data sets you know specific tensorflow light all, all these little minutia of stuff that you could find 15 articles how to do it it's probably not going to apply how how frigate's written in the back end how it's going to you know take in the model and stuff like that so um, I mean, I, I think it's awesome for me. It's, it's been great so far. I mean, I think there's, there's of course still room for improvement and you still have to use all the min max size, make different zones. You still have to do all that stuff. But I think if, as long as you do that, 
and use the custom models, the chance of having a false positive are extremely low or almost zero. Um, I'm hoping of the day that we don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore, which I don't think is here for, for a while. Um, but I mean, I, I definitely recommend everybody try it out. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. Um, on the back end side of things, did you, are you the one that developed the whole back end architecture for submitting images? It looks like just some reading some of the documentation based on AWS and, and run pod, which is like a, a model GPU training service. Is that something that you did or any contributors help with, or just give us a no, high level I, overview I, of that? Yeah, I, I did all that myself. I mean, it wouldn't really, um, if it's not open source code, then like I couldn't really um, ask others to do. And, you know, I, I think I had a lot of familiarity with AWS infrastructure um, just through work. And so that was the easiest part of the whole thing for me, really. Um, once I knew how to train the models and get that working and had my head wrapped around how that was going to work, the, the rest of it was was far easier. I, I built the whole, um, the whole, uh, SAS platform for Frigate Plus and all the, everything in AWS, um, and in about 60 days, um, kind of pulled all that together, the annotation tool and the whole UI and database backend and, and all of it. Um, just because I've done so much of that kind of thing professionally over the years. Um, but it's all based on, uh, it, it, I'm using kind of Lambda, um, serverless, um, backend for the API. Um, you know, obviously like just about everything relying pretty heavily on S3 for storing, um, uh, for storing the image data and I'm using DynamoDB as a database backend, uh, because it's serverless and I really wanted to start with something that was pay per use so that I didn't right. have to shoulder a whole bunch of cost to run expensive server instances. So that's really where I went on serverless. So the, the cost will scale along with usage. Um, and the, um, and it's just a really, really hyperscalable infrastructure. So I don't, I don't think there's really, I don't really have any concerns about scalability of the service there. Um, and then all the training stuff I had to, you know, I just implemented all that very recently, right? Um, and that uses a bunch of, um, it uses some scheduled Lambda functions, it uses some uh, queuing, um, managed queues in AWS, uh, and it interfaces with RunPod. RunPod is really just a, uh, all they do is provide like pretty basic um, GPU instances that you can run your own containers on. So um, they don't really provide any sort of service or help around like how to train your stuff. Like I had to build the whole container with all the NVIDIA library support, with all the kind of CUDA and TensorFlow libraries. Um, and all they do, you just point them at a at an image, and they just spin up your container for you on an instance with access to a GPU, and that's all they do. Right. Um, but it was seems just, like a little bit cheaper than AWS, or maybe some um, different instance sizes in terms of GPU. Just just some high level looking at it. I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. It's a little less expensive than AWS. I mean, it. it depending on what instance sizes you need, it can be quite a bit cheaper than AWS, but a big part of it was also just availability. Like the competition mm. for GPU instances in AWS is really, really high. So yeah. like even just trying to, like I tried to run stuff in, a, I tried to build all of that in AWS, even though it was gonna be more expensive at first, but then I just realized that like, even ju just setting up uh, you know, a service that runs jobs with a GPU instance was going to be really, really tough just because like, there's not any availability for instances. Um, yeah. so run pod was easy enough to work with. It's, it's worked pretty well. Um, and they perform a pretty limited, uh, temporal service for me. So there's no, like, n there's no data that persists on their side at all. Um, the, your, an instance spins up, it pulls down a pre prepared training set, runs the training, uploads the finished model and nothing persists. So, 
um it's a pretty and and it's it's a like uh, i can parallelize a lot like i can have a, a lot of instances running and processing that queue of model requests concurrently so i think that will scale pretty well too and unless they fold as a business or unless they um you know don't have availability i've seen periods of time where they don't have availability for the gpu types that i that i'm using so one of the most important things of Frigate Plus, of course, is annotating the images for the custom models. Every time I upload images, the bounding boxes are always a little off. Sometimes they're a bit too big, sometimes they're too small, but that's clearly noted in the documentation. What drives me a little crazy is that when things are overlapping, and you also talk about that in the documentation, right? But what I wanna know is if two different bounding boxes are overlapping, maybe sometimes the image that you're annotating is off the screen, do all these things, do they impact the accuracy of the model at all? Also overfitting, so submitting the same image so many times, whether it's a positive or negative image, do either of these things really have an impact on the custom model at all? Yeah, I think most of those sorts of issues around overfitting and um, uh, can really I can handle those as a part of the model prep process over time as, as I start seeing some of those potential challenges. You get remember your images are really only being used for that tiny little bit at the end. Um, so the risk of overfitting or you're kind of you're almost just like biasing the model a little bit towards the specific what is specifically background in your images. Um, and what is specific, what specifically things look like. Because I, I haven't looked at a lot of different users' cameras. I will tell you that um, <clears throat> there's quite a, quite a few times where I look at an, an image and I'm like, well, I could see how you would know that that's a person if you understood the scene and you were really familiar with it. Um, but on another user's camera, I could see how that exact same box would look just like a pile of clothes on the floor or something or would just be a pile of clothes so like a lot of it is about um there's a lot of kind of context type stuff like that um but i don't i'm not a general as long as you're annotating to the best of your ability there's going to be some things that are aren't ideal but I don't think that there's going to be enough of those for any given user to really have a substantially negative impact. Um, at least that's just my kind of intuition. I could be proven wrong over time and, you know, we'll have to adapt and adjust as necessary. Um, but I just don't really see that being the major issue. The major challenges that I see is just like, bad labeling, uh, like kind of just lazy labeling, bounding boxes that aren't tight, missing bounding boxes altogether. And another one that I do worry about a lot and think about a lot is just unrealistic expectations based on the actual camera. I mean, there's quite a few people who have a wise cam mounted on a windowsill looking through a screen. Um, and, you know, I look at some of these images and I'm like, I, I'm a person and I'm looking at this with my eyes. And I could not have told you that that was a dog or a person. Um, and so I, I think over time I'll have to um, start to figure out. I, I've even pondered the idea of like, should I be trying to break the data set out into like... Um, higher quality cameras, really low quality cameras, like there's, there can be quite a big difference from kind of person to person or camera to camera in terms of quality. And I can see how some of those really low quality images could be creating false positives for other users because they're just not really distinguishable. So I think over time, that's largely about me improving the way that I'm refining and selecting things for the base data set. I'm, 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 I'm somewhat selective about what's get, what gets pulled in there. Like I'm trying to pull in more clear cut examples um, and things that are like iffy or I think might be confusing for some, I'm just like taking that out uh, or not including that in the base. So 
it, I, I want the the base model to do really well on like really uh, clear cut examples of different object types. Um, that's been my approach so far. One of the things I thought about the other day was, boy, is it going to be fun on the Frigate discussion forums now that everybody's going to have their own custom model. Personally, with Frigate Plus, with the custom model, I've seen a few deviations from, let's say, version 4 to version 5 of my custom model. For the most part, things have gotten better, but there have been some, some differences. So, for example, in one of my zones in my driveway, um, objects far away stop being detected after a few custom models, and I had to tweak that slightly. But everything closer, the detection percentage got a bit higher. So it, overall, things are getting better, but it's still going to require everybody to send them the min and max sizes, um, set the, the amount of pixels certain objects should be in certain zones. None of that's gonna, really going to go away. So as I'm starting to think about that, another question I had was about you know, right now, Forget is still using the mobile net uh, SSD model under the hood with TensorFlow Lite. Do you foresee a time um, when potentially the YOLO model would be available as a custom model? Uh, personally at home, I'm running uh, Code Project AI uh, along with um, Forget Plus custom models. I'm running two different uh, instances of Forget right now just to see the difference. And the YOLO model with Code Project AI definitely is a bit more accurate in, in um, a lot of situations. Even though it does require a, a huge NVIDIA GPU under the hood and it takes a lot more compute power. So just, what are your thoughts on that, Blake? I think there's a bunch of other model architectures, right? You can take the same training set, you can pipe that through different training approaches, different architectures. Um, <clears throat> I started really with the, trying to be consistent with what um, what's supported on the Coral and what I've seen the best results with um, in terms of the Coco models. So that's, that's really why I started there. Um, but, you know, I'd really, I'm, I'm trying to let, um, I'm, I'm trying to think about prioritization of those different model types based on the kind of scope of users who will be impacted. So I think the, the next thing I'd really like to do is get to a place where, um, if you're using the open Vino Intel, um, detection stuff that, that will um, be supported. And I think a part of, I think a side effect of that um, effort will also mean compiling the Frigate Plus models to the ONNX, which um, uh, the Onyx, or I don't even know how to pronounce it, I just see ONNX, um, but making them compatible with that, which is kind of a general purpose um, model uh, export that can be imported and converted into other things too. Um, so I think that may, um, kind of broaden some of the options there. Um, and, uh, definitely want to try the yellow stuff too. I, I just think have seen kind of mixed, um, mixed success in really getting a yellow model working on a coral, um, different versions of it. You know, the, the Coral has a pretty limited set of operations that it can run. Um, so I, I think that's definitely coming, but it's just, you know, got to prioritize. So there's been a lot of discussion on the Frigate forums talking about privacy. So people are asking, you know, why do I have to upload my own images? Is this secure? Um, I, you know, personally in, in my deployment in Frigate um, before Frigate Plus, I didn't allow my Frigate container to talk to the internet. Everything was being proxied through Home Assistant. So for me, uh, when when Frigate Plus was first announced before the custom models was, I didn't uh, didn't upload anything. Sadly, you know, I'm ashamed to admit it. Um, but once the custom models were available, I started uploading like crazy. But for me, the big difference is that from a privacy point of view, I have control of what images get uploaded. It's just not just randomly uploading every object that gets detected in my camera. It's just not uploading video feeds. So what do you have to say for the people that are concerned about security and, and privacy of their of their footage and, and images um, in relation to Frigate Plus? Yeah, I mean, I think that that was exactly why I threw the, I asked first, right, before I went in and built this stuff. I think that was my biggest hesitation and like would the community of users that have been drawn to Frigate who like I still kind of understand to be um, that that's a big part of why they run Frigate to begin with, right? Is they want to do, they want all the, you know, uh, AI analysis of their video feeds, but they don't really want to be piping it out to Amazon or Google all the time. Um, 
So I was, you know, kind of hesitant at first, like maybe this is something that like, it's just, you know, the wrong thing for the wrong audience. Um, and, um, you know, enough people said that they were, they, they would be fine with it. Um, so I decided to, to create it. I mean, and I, and I totally like, so I only have exterior cameras, right? Like I, um, I think that's a different thing than people who do have interior cameras. But I, I think if you look at what's been implemented in Frigate, um, re in relation to Frigate Plus is that like the only stuff that goes from Frigate to Frigate Plus is like driven by intentional user action. Um, and I built it that way intentionally. Uh, I, you know, could have done, a, I could have made a lot of other decisions in terms of the way that I wanted to work. And, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to maintain that kind of like sense of control. Um, and I, and I also think that, um, uh, like frigate should continue to be capable of running without internet access. So, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, that's, that's the goal at least. Um, so even things like, you know, you can, you can save your models that get downloaded in the model cache and you can, uh, you can use them, you can use them offline. Um, so I think there's a lot of confusion that some people had initially in terms of, you know, does this mean that my, you know, video feeds are being sent out 24 seven for analysis all the time? It's like, no, no, it still works exactly the same way that it did before in that regard. So, I mean, I, I it's, you know, I mentioned this before, you know, when I created the business, I spent a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, the terms of use and privacy policies. And uh, I think, I feel like I'm pretty in tune with, um, the user base and the way that they think about some of those things. And so I really wanted to make sure that what I implemented in, um, in that capacity felt like fair and reasonable and transparent. And so I've tried to, I've tried my best really to, to maintain that, um, in kind of articulating, you know, what, what do I have the right to do with the, uh, images that you submit? And it's, it's really just, uh, I have the right to provide you the service that you're paying for. Um, that's, that's really it. Um, and you know, I'm doing, uh, kind of, I'm making every commercially reasonable effort to, to continue to protect and make sure that that user's data, um, you know, is secure in, in that environment as well. I've, you know, I have a, spent my whole career building infrastructure and the software as a service applications, um, in, uh, in AWS that manage really sensitive uh, genetic testing information about patients that's in a highly regulated protected industry. And nobody knows everything about security and nobody ever doesn't make mistakes or run into problems. Um, but um, I, have a, I have more experience in that arena than, than most, most people. Yeah, so that, that totally makes sense. And I think once people understand how Forget Plus works, they'll be less concerned about security implications, right? You know, you have complete control over what screenshots get uploaded. And if you're doing something illegal in your driveway, maybe you shouldn't upload that image to Forget Plus for model training, right? Um, for me, it doesn't really bother me at all in terms of from a security point of view. I have complete control of what images get uploaded. And if I don't want to upload an image, I'm just not going to upload it. So lastly, Blake, I wanted to talk about where you see Frigate going in the future. So I know there's probably a huge backlog of um, improvements that you're wanting to do on the project, but there's also been a lot of discussions on the forums about you know, people making a custom Frigate app if people are not using the Home Assistant integration. Of course, improvements with, with the custom models in Frigate Plus. So what are the top priorities uh, going forward and, and where do you see the project going in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, my focus has been very intentionally uh, on just improving the core functionality of Frigate, um, really, um, re really trying to just make it work well for the community that is the current user base and intentionally uh, keeping that more targeted at a more technical audience. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of benefit that we get today by having a highly technical user base that is capable of execing into a Docker container and running a command when we need them to, to try to figure out what the heck's going on. 
I think that's a big part of what helps keep the support burden where it is today and allows us to continue to improve it. I think once once I feel like um, it's to a place where it's more you know stable and approachable and consistent for a broader set of users who are non technical, then I think that's definitely in the in the future. the 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 next kind of iteration is um, we've been for a couple of releases now building a really really rich. Uh, annotated database in your SQLite database that you run about a lot of information about what's happening in your video feeds, right? So for every segment of your recordings that's retained in your database, there's a bunch of metadata. We know how much motion occurred there. We know whether there were objects in the frame. We know whether there was sound in there. Like there's a bunch of interesting metadata associated with your whole timeline of video recordings. And we've kind of um, been iterating on the back end for quite a while, but we're not leveraging any of that like rich information um, in, in the UI at all. And so I think it's, I think the next release is kind of tentatively going to be focused around doing a complete UI revamp. Um, you have to remember that um, Frigate first started without even the concept of events, and then there were events, which were individual video clips, oftentimes video clips that were duplicative of each other, right? If there was a dog and a person, you record the same video multiple times. Um, and then, af and that's where the whole events view originated, right? And then, independent from that, 24 seven recording was implemented. And so that's why you have a separation of like the events view and the recordings view. And there's a little bit of overlap there. There's quite a bit of overlap there, but the genesis of all that was uh, because recordings were just like a totally separate thing from events originally. Um, and so they were implemented as a kind of a unique part of the UI. And then events were really refactored to pull from the same video segments that recordings were using. So now we've kind of got this disjointed UI um, where you're looking at the same video in two different ways. And, and it's not really, um, it's not, it's not that great in terms of its ability to like allow you to kind of scrub through a whole night or a day's worth of recordings. Right. I mean, the best, I mean, the best setup I think, and what I run is um, I do motion based recording um, for, you know, um, like a week. And when I want to go and see like, Hey, what happened last night? I go pull up the camera and I put it at 16 X times and, um, uh, and I, you know, play it back. Right. And because it's motion based, like I'm going to see all the like little bits of motion and I can watch a whole night's worth of recordings in like a minute or two. And, and that's, that's, that, that's feasible. Um, but there's a lot of room for improvement there. Right. Um, so I, I think um, we've got some interesting ideas for ways to really Im improve and revamp the UI to kind of combine those things together, get a more kind of congruent timeline based view of like um, basically like video analytics overlaid on a timeline that I think will be um, a much better experience for that that use case specifically. Um, and once the UI reaches that threshold, I think, as I think further out in the future, um, you know, just starting to improve some of the initial onboarding experience, right? Like today, you can't start Frigate without a config file. Um, it doesn't work with a blank config file, but you should be able to just spin it up and be able to start using the config editor in the UI <coughs> from the outset. But you can't do that today, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of really good opportunities to do things that are like a guided wizard for adding a new camera where you can, um, you know, even like watch the real time and tune your motion detection values to get them to settle right. And kind of, a, um, you know, you could plug in your RTSP URL and we could do a frame grab and make sure that it works and all that sort of stuff. Like there's a whole bunch of that sort of stuff over time. I know a bunch of people have asked this over the years, um, and I've said no like a million times, but we are going to add authentication at some point. Um, 
and uh, I just got to make sure that it's done in the way that um, I think uh, I don't want to I don't want to implement it in a, implement it in a way that um, makes it annoying or challenging or use or um, frustrating for people who have put an authentication layer in front like I have personally um, because I want one login for all my services and so I just want to make sure whatever we do works well for that sort of use case too um, uh, and then, uh, you know, I think it's definitely within the realm of possibility of doing something similar to what Home Assistant did with dedicated kind of frigate branded, you know, small form factor PCs. Um, there's a bunch of vendors. Um, I've, I've been contacted a few times already by some manufacturers about putting together that sort of stuff with like a bundle of cameras and they could be pre-configured with static IPs and a PoE switch. Like, I think that's within the realm of, of feasibility there I think we're but we're a few steps away from that in terms of an app I think um, you know if you remember it took a really long time for home assistant to even get an official app um, it was a community effort for a really long time and um, at some point it reached a threshold where they kind of brought the primary developers for that app um, onto the team and <coughs> it became more official at that point so I would see, you know, potentially Frigate taking the same sort of path there. Um, my my inclination would be to continue to invest in like making Frigate even better in terms of uh, feeling more native inside of Home Assistant. Um, it it that could that experience could be better, and in particular. Um, because not not in a large percentage of Brigitte users don't use HassOS with add-ons, um, and the um, or HassOS at all. So I think um, there's there's quite a bit of room for improvement in terms of um, relying on the integration to provide a, a a custom panel in in Home Assistant that feels like a, a an even more native experience inside of Home Assistant. Um, and I think that would be, um, that'd be a good direction to go in. I, I think, I think a lot about our, the success of Frigate was because I very intentionally built it from the beginning as something that, you know, was designed to be tightly tied into Home Assistant. Um, it was, it was originally intended to be an extension of my home automation platform, um, that basically gave me sensor data coming off my cameras that I could pull into Home Assistant. I mean, that, that's what I that's what I built it for initially. Um, I wanted to be able to trigger automations off of video related sensors. And um, it was, you know, it didn't even have a UI in the beginning. There was no web interface at all. It was just a service you ran uh, with a config file and you connected it to Home Assistant and you got some, you know, images popped out of it and you got some sensor values. Um, so I, I think that will continue to be, continue to be a big part of the focus of forget as we move forward is like the, I wanted to probably continue to be one of the best, um, one of the best in VR solutions for home assistant users because it's just kind of tightly integrated there. And I think, I think there's, there's a handful of ways I can think to make that quite a bit better. So. I really want to thank Blake for coming on the show. It was really interesting to get a behind the scenes look of Frigate. Be sure to check out version 13, which is currently in beta. Don't forget about Frigate Plus to get your custom models also currently in beta. Until next time, this is Roger's Tech Talk.